Welcome and thank you for joining the KCF Spring Webinar Series. I'm Elise Noyes, one of our executive assistants, and I'll be helping to moderate questions today. Our first session, Predictive Maintenance, Why It's More Important and More do Doable Than Ever Before, will be presented by Dave Craig, our Vice President of Customer Success. After his presentation, there will be time for your questions. If you have one you'd like to submit, please send it to me via the chat on the right. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy. I'll kick it off over to Dave. Thanks, Elise, and thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, so like Elise said, uh, I'm going to go through a presentation here. Um, we'll probably move pretty fast and cover some information, but anywhere along the way, if you have a question, just put it into the Q&A and we'll see those come up and then uh, have some time to respond at the end. So the point of today's talk is really to talk about predictive maintenance. And before I get into that, since I know some folks might be new to KCF, uh, I wanted to give just a quick overview of what we do. So KCF was founded in 2000 and really started as a consultancy solving complicated vibration and acoustics problems, mostly using off the shelf hardware and software that other people were making. And then as time went by, we really got into making our own products to serve that need, uh, both software and hardware for monitoring machine health, vibration in particular, um, but with a lot of other aspects too. So a lot of our development has been funded through government research. So you see a lot of products here, um, projects being funded by the Navy and the Army, Department of Energy, agencies like that. And so we worked on all these targeted things to build up our wireless infrastructure, our low power sensing capability, uh, the encryption and the wireless protocol for sending all this data over the air efficiently. So those products developed over time and then really over the last uh, 10 or so years is when we got into smart diagnostics, which is the product we're offering now for monitoring industrial machine health, asset health and really getting into the sentry service area too, which is our problem solving and remote monitoring um, service arm of our business that we'll talk about as we go forward. So that's just sort of a quick overview of the history. So what I wanted to talk about today has to do with the concept of reshoring. You hear this word um, and what does it mean? So you hear people talk a lot about bringing manufacturing back to the US and we've kind of seen recently it's a big deal, right? Especially with the virus going on, it's really highlighted that it's bad and kind of life endangering to have certain life sustaining products manufactured overseas, right? We've seen if there's safety equipment and pharmaceutical products and things like paper products, it becomes a real problem if we don't have access to those things and if the manufacturing of those is taking place somewhere else. So what that's going to do is just create even more of a push to bring manufacturing back here to reshore those operations. So that's great, right? Um, but there's a problem and that's just this conception that everything is cheaper in China, right? Or maybe some other country. Um, it'll be cheaper to produce the products there. So it's hard to bring it back here if we can't compete with that price. And depending on the type of product, that price difference is pretty big. It can be anywhere from 5% on the low end to maybe 100% on the high end. And we'll talk a little bit about what controls that. So what factors into that? Why is stuff cheaper in China? So if we look at the different factors, what's on our side of the table and what's on their side? So there's actually a lot of stuff in our court. So believe it or not, land is cheaper here in the types of areas where manufacturing takes place. A lot of the manufacturing areas in China are really overcrowded and there's not a lot of space there. So land is actually easier to come by here. So are some natural resources um, and energy things. So electricity and natural gas, we have an advantage. We also have an advantage actually when it comes to money and banking, moving money around borrowing to start a business, borrowing to fund material uh, purchasing and things like that. It's actually easier here. And then obviously, if you're going to be selling a product in the US, the logistics and the shipping and all those things are simpler if you just keep it on shore here. So what's the big thing they have in their court? Labor, right? Labor is cheaper overseas. And that's really the 
the main thing that's driving that cost difference. So how does that look in terms of cost to manufacture? You know, I mentioned it could be anywhere from like five to 100% difference in cost, depending on what you're making. It really has to do with how labor intensive it is. So if you're making a product in the US and let's say it costs a dollar, if it's a highly manual thing to make, you know, if it's like sewing together blue jeans or something like that, that's a highly manual process, it's gonna be 100% cheaper over there. It's gonna cost half as much, right? It's gonna cost 50 cents to produce that product. But if it's a more automated thing, if it's printing circuit boards, if it's CNC machining of a part, if it's injection molding of something, um, you know, a highly automated process like that, there's not a lot of labor involved. So that's where it's really more only like a 5% difference. So for these automated types of things, the gap we need to make up is not as big. So the question then is, how are we gonna make up that gap? If we need to make up 5%, 50%, 100% of a cost on a product, how are we gonna do that? So one factor is that foreign countries' labor costs are actually rising a lot faster than ours. This is good and bad, right? It's, it's good because we'll catch up. It's bad because we're not, our workers are not getting paid a lot more as time goes by. So we could kind of wait for that to catch up, but the population difference is a problem. So again, we talked about for handmade, you know, hand assembled type of goods, we'd have to make up 100% uh, of the cost. And it might be kind of out of reach, purely from a labor perspective. And so for an example, here's some head counts of some different companies. So these first three are companies you might've heard of, right? You got places like GM, Ford, GE. These are some big US manufacturers and they have head counts of, you know, 150 to 200,000 people, something like that. The last column over here, this is Foxconn. These are the people that assemble iPhones. So they make basically one product, you know, a, a family of products. They've got 800,000 employees, many of whom are hand assembling things. So that might be something that we're just not going to compete with. We're, we're not going to compete with those low paying hand assembled jobs where you just need hundreds of thousands of people in a factory cranking out widgets might be out of reach and it might not be great for us to get into. But for those machine made goods we talked about where you really only need to make up like a 5% difference, that kind of seems doable and within reach. So the question is how can we do that? How can we make up 5% of the total operating costs of a manufacturing plant? So some things come to mind, you know, it seems unlikely that materials are magically gonna get 5% cheaper we don't really want to pay our workers 5% less or fire 5% of them, right? We don't want to try to make it up there. Energy is probably not magically going to get cheaper. The logistics system, again, if we're within the US, it's kind of pretty optimized. We're probably not going to make up big ground there. But there's a big thing, maintenance. So there's a question here. What percentage of a budget at a typical manufacturing plant goes to maintenance and people have studied this and the answer depending on the plant ranges anywhere from 15 to 40 percent so that's a big chunk of that plant's budget that's available right 15 to 40 percent we're probably not going to find that anywhere else so that's a that's a area we could play in maybe if we could cut that down significantly that could be where we make up our five percent so if we say that's important, right? If maintenance is important and the health of our equipment is important, you kind of start thinking about machine health and what, what kind of goes into that. So there's really a lot of things. If your machines are healthier, you're gonna have less unplanned downtime. You're gonna be safer because your folks won't be swinging into action, putting out fires and fixing stuff in an emergency condition. Your quality of your product can go up. If your machine is running better, you're not gonna scrap as much stuff. Your energy consumption will go down because your machinery is running more efficiently. The machine will last longer because you're treating it better. And you'll have fewer repair and inspection costs. And you might not have to keep as many spare parts on the shelf. So that helps the bottom line too. You don't have so much money tied up in inventory. So all those things, all related to machine health, 
increase a company's profitability. They all equate to money. So that's kind of a big deal. So if we say, okay, maintenance is real important, machine health is real important, how could we go about planning our maintenance routine to be most efficient? So that sets you down the road of thinking about what are the different kinds of maintenance schemes? And for those of you that are in maintenance, I'm sure you're pretty familiar with these. So we're gonna hit them real fast. So the first one that a lot of people do and people really don't like because it's frustrating and, and dangerous is reactive maintenance. So this is when you just run stuff until it breaks and then you swing into action and you fix it. And so everything breaks, it's scary, people get hurt, you have unplanned downtime, it's bad. Uh, so this is kind of the most risky environment to do your maintenance in. It's the easiest. You don't have to set up any sort of program or tools or anything special. You just need some folks there that can fix stuff when it fails. Uh, but it's risky because you just don't know when things are going to break and you're going to have to fix it right away. So to sort of combat that, the next thing people get into is preventive maintenance. So this is where you're more forward looking. You're thinking, all right, we're not going to let this thing fail. We're not, not going to run it to failure. We're going to do some scheduled maintenance ahead of time. So this is changing your oil in your car, right? You do that on a schedule, but it's super conservative. So the engine in your car might run 100,000 miles, maybe it'd run 200,000 miles on a crankcase of oil. I don't really know, but it would run for a long time. We change our oil at five or 10,000 miles to be absolutely sure nothing will fail, right? We take it really, really conservative based on worst case uh, usage cases, just to be really sure. So it's wasteful. We're throwing away oil while it's still good. We're replacing parts while they're still good because we're being preventive and careful, um, but wasteful. So this is, it hurts the bottom line. It's bad for the environment. Um, it's safe and it's comfortable and you feel good, uh, but it's it has some downsides. So the next step, which again is the topic of today's talk, predictive maintenance. So predictive maintenance, you're not waiting until it breaks, but you're not also just blindly replacing stuff way before it would break. You're studying the health of the asset using some data. And we'll talk about what kinds of data you can use, but you're studying how it's being used, how healthy it is, and then you're performing maintenance and operations on it based on what it needs. It's tailored to its particular needs, not just to some blind schedule. So that's kind of a game changer, right? And then people think that's sort of the end, but we might want to go even a step beyond that to what we would call optimized maintenance. So in predictive maintenance, you're just studying how you're using the machine, how healthy it is, and you're changing your maintenance scheme. In an optimized program, you might actually change the way you operate the machine. So instead of just saying, OK, yeah, this is how we run it. So here's how often we need to change the oil and here's how often we need to change these parts. You might say, whoa, wait a minute. What if we change the way we ran this thing? What if we ran it at a different speed or we change the configuration of it? We optimize it so we reduce the damage that we're doing to this machine and we actually engineer out those failures from happening. So that's kind of the next level. So KCF is really a company that can help companies move from reactive, past preventive, and getting into predictive or optimized maintenance. But these things are hard. So predictive and optimized maintenance, you gotta have machine health data, you gotta be doing root cause analysis, you gotta be doing a lot of thinking. So it's tough. And traditionally, it's been hard in the past. So I want to talk a little bit about just what's different now that makes it more doable. So to start, let's talk a little bit about the products that are new that are allowing that. And then we'll talk about people too. So from the product side, sensors have gotten cheaper. And there's really a few things that have driven that. In our particular case, I'd really say there's kind of three enabling technologies within our sensor. You've got cheap accelerometers, cheap batteries, and cheap radios. If you think about it, all of those are things all of us carry in our pocket these days in a cell phone. So the fact that billions and billions of cell phones have been made, it's driven the cost of these things down, and it's made it possible to make a sensor like this that includes a lot of those technologies 
at a pretty reasonable price point where you can just flood them everywhere. It's no longer a thing where the sensor was crazy expensive and you had to be very selective about where to use it. It's to the point now where you can use it more broadly. So that's the sensor side. Um, what KCF has done is really tried to make it very easy to implement this everywhere, make an installation super easy and fast. So we've really pioneered a three phase installation procedure. So we'll come on site and work with you and do what we call a site assessment. We figure out what sensors you need, what network hardware you'll need, how to mount everything, how to interface with your IT department, make a plan and figure out what we're going to do. Then we'll come back and do the installation. And then the final step is what we call a system calibration, which is really making sure just everything is working right. Data is getting to the right places. The right people are getting notifications. The right people have user access, just kind of tying up all the loose ends. And so that used to be like a highly on site manual engaged process with KCF. More recently, because of the virus and travel restrictions, it's really made us motivated to make that doable remotely. So that's something that our team can work with you now. We can coach you through doing this so you can handle a lot of the on site activities. We can be supporting you remotely. So even with travel restrictions and stuff, there's no reason to sort of take a pause and put this on break. We can move forward right now. And the other thing just to point out that's different than in the past, our sensors can be set up usually really fast. Most of these things mount magnetically, so you just slap it on the machine, get it in the right place and you're done. There's not a lot of um, like shutdowns and wiring and things like that that would need to happen in the past where you'd need electricians and skilled trades folks in there um, really working on the machine for a long time. A lot of times we can instrument the machine while it's still running or at the worst, we might need to do, you know, a lockout tag out for a few minutes, put our sensors on and then get out. It's not a long, complicated process. So that's kind of new. The other thing that's really new is just where the data goes. So in the past, it might go to an analyzer or to a computer on site, a server. It was very localized and in one place. It's now remote and cloud based. So you can get all the data from all your machines anywhere in the world where you've got a web browser, your phone, tablet, computer, whatever. Um, and the other cool thing is that every aspect of our system can be changed remotely. So we can change sampling frequencies. We can change how often we're collecting data. We can change where that data is going to and who's getting notified. All that stuff can be set up remotely. So it really gives a lot more freedom than you had in the past in terms of how you get this data and what you do with it. So that's more on the hardware and software side, sort of what's new and new capabilities. The other thing I'd like to highlight um, is just what that looks like in terms of the data. So in the past, if you had like a pump, let's say in your plant and you put a sensor on it and you had to pay an electrician to wire it and everything, now you're getting data from it. The data you get might have been something like this. You'd get an alarm and it would say, here's your overall vibration level and this is bad. It's too much vibration. Something is wrong with this machine. So you need to go fix it. And this was really challenging though, because if you look at this system, which is really simple, right? It's just a motor driving a pump. There's not that much to it. But if you think about what's contributing to the vibration, there's so many sources, right? Because this motor has lots of moving parts in it. It's got a rotor that's being driven by the electric field from the stator. It's got bearings in both ends of it that have got balls rolling around in it. There's a coupling here. We've got more bearings in the pump. The pump has the impeller vanes. The whole thing is mounted to a structure. Maybe there's other things contributing like the machine next to it. So you might literally have hundreds of sources of vibration all contributing to this one number. So if the number is too high, how do you know where it's coming from, right? It, you don't really know which component to go look at. So it's frustrating. Uh, when you, you have this information, you know something's wrong, but you don't really know where to go. So KCF sensors do something different. 
they don't just send an overall vibration level that's like the sum of everything that's happening. They send a time waveform. So you're going to get something like this, which again may not look super useful because this is the total vibration from all of those components. So this has the bearing rollers in it. This has the electrical input. you'll see like you'll see like this right here this first peak that's the speed at which the motor is turning and then you'll have harmonics of that and then up here you've got another peak this is the number of rotor bars in the armature of that motor so all of the different components have a different frequency so now if i see one of these peaks change in height i know it has to be coming from the component that corresponds to that frequency so it's a little confusing, but what you end up with then is that different fault conditions look totally different. So here's four different fault conditions. They have different shapes to them. They also have different colors because I made them different colors. But a vibration analyst can look at these and these almost look, it's a language. These look like different words to them because they've studied what these things mean. They have different shapes to them. So like this represents a misalignment which looks completely different than if that pump were cavitating, or if a bearing was starting to fail, or if the inside of that motor was starting to fail. So because we have that detailed time waveform and we can turn it into a frequency spectrum, we can see specific fault conditions. We don't just have an overall alarm saying, hey, something's wrong, go figure it out. We can point directly to a problem. So again, that's that's a new enabling technology that has existed in the past. People have had accelerometers for a long time and they've been studying these things. But the idea that you can now have that information on every machine in your plant every minute if you want it, that's quite different than in the past. And then the other thing I'd like to highlight is just the people. So if you do this, if you get into this world and you say, OK, we're going to go predictive, we're going to put sensors on all the equipment in our
the pee to people and take on a whole new capability and a whole new training set. So that's that's where we really see a lot of engagement and value with our customers. You can buy our hardware and just implement it yourself and see what happens and you'll definitely get value out of it. But we see the best value when we engage as partners and solve problems together. And then I would also just throw out that team has some other pretty wild advanced capabilities where we can come in and we've got like special cameras where we can actually amplify the motion that's happening in your machinery so you can see what's going on and we can actually tie it to like physical phenomena. We can do fluid dynamics analysis. We can do finite element stuff. If there's custom sensors in your plant already, we can pull that data into smart diagnostics as well. So if you have existing maybe like humidity sensors or pressure or um, pH level or something that's key to your process, we can pull that in and marry that up with the vibration data and do a lot of correlations to figure out how to optimize that system. So it's a really powerful team. Um, I encourage you to reach out and learn more about it. So let's circle back to where we started. So we talked a lot about we got to make up this difference with China somehow. And we've talked now about how predictive and optimized maintenance maybe are the way to do that. So let's look at the numbers and see, is it really possible? How much does this stuff cost? So people have studied this. So for your machinery, if you look at the amount of horsepower it has, there's a cost to maintaining it in terms of dollars per horsepower per year. So for a reactive model, just run it till it breaks, fix it, see what happens it's going to cost you about $18 per horsepower per year to do that maintenance. If you can switch to a preventive model, you're going to cut down on some failures, right? But you're also going to waste a lot of stuff being extremely conservative in that VM program. You'll drop your cost to about $13 per horsepower per year. If you go predictive, you're going to see it drop to about nine. And if you go optimize and really rethink the way things are running, change the way your plant runs, you can actually get down to about $6 per horsepower per year. So if we go reactive to predictive, cut our costs in half, right? If we go predictive to optimized, we can get it down to a, like a third of that reactive cost. So that means it's doable, right? We said we needed to save 5% maybe roughly to compete with foreign manufacturing we said the maintenance budget was like 15 to 40 percent. So let's call it, you know, 25 percent or something. And we're saying right here, if we're smart, we can cut our maintenance budget about in half or maybe even down to a third. So it's doable. We can make up that 5 percent to foreign manufacturers. And to prove it, here's just a nice example from a customer of ours. So you'll see some data here. This is a pressure pumping company. So their whole business is pumping fluids using positive displacement pumps. So maintenance of those pumps, that's their whole game. Like that's their biggest expense. So if you look at the vertical axis here, I would actually highlight this isn't even just their maintenance cost. This is their total operating costs. So capital expenditures plus repair and maintenance. So you'll see when we started working with them about four years ago, it cost them about $7,000 an hour to operate, to own and operate a pump. And after working with us for a couple years, you'll see this didn't happen overnight, but over a couple years, that cost went down and down and down to where it was a little under $3,500 per pumping hour. So that proves it, right? They went from a totally reactive model to a predictive model and just like the industry data shows, they cut their costs about in half. So it's totally doable. So some of the closing thoughts I'd like to leave you with, I see these numbers come up a lot, 80-20, right? You see this concept a lot, you hear people talk about it, and I've, I've just seen these numbers coming to the surface a lot recently. So the first thing is, people have studied this for decades, 80% of machines don't actually wear out. They fail suddenly and randomly. So you'll find studies from the military, from aviation industry, from automotive, automotive industry. Lots of studies come to this conclusion that about 80% of machines just break. 
without warning and without a slow steady wear out period. So what that means is 80% of the time PMs aren't going to work. Preventive maintenance isn't going to work, right? The whole premise of preventive maintenance is that the thing is gradually going to wear out and you're going to do some maintenance early on to not let it wear out. But if 80% of stuff fails randomly, that means only about 20% of machines are going to respond well to that PM program. The other thing we've seen recently is that about 80% of PMs are ineffective. People tell us, right? We have customers that we work with very closely. They tell us every time they do a PM and we can look at the data before and after. And what it comes down to is about 80% of the time, it's ineffective it does not have an immediate positive impact on the health of the machine. So if you go back to the classic example of like, what is a PM? Changing oil in your car, right? So there's kind of, there's several things that can happen when you do that. Either it addresses a problem that didn't exist, right? So like I change the oil in my car all the time. It always looks fine. So I take the oil out. I send the oil off for analysis to a lab and they say this oil is great. You could have run it for a lot longer. So I'm addressing a problem that didn't exist. The oil was not worn out. So that's not effective. You could also have the situation where it doesn't address a problem that did exist, right? If I have a spun bearing in my engine or valves that are stuck shut or whatever, changing the oil won't fix that. So that PM is not going to solve a problem that does exist. Or really the one we see a lot of times is it creates a problem that didn't exist. So for instance, what if I change the oil in my car and I forget to tighten the oil filter or I forget to put fresh oil back in? Now I fire my car up and I take it out for a drive and I destroy the engine. And it would have been fine if I'd left it alone, but because I screwed up the PM procedure, now I've toasted my engine. So again, about 80% of the time, we see PMs being something that probably doesn't need to happen. Only about 20% of the time do we see a PM and then we see a sudden improvement in the health of the machine. So it's something to think about that PMs might not be the best thing in the world and it might make a lot more sense to go to a predictive model. So the other thing, when I talk about 80-20, Again, those numbers kind of come up a lot. You might think about your plant and just kind of walk through it in your mind and think like, where's the money coming from in this plant? And you might find, maybe, depends on the industry, but you might find that if you think about that, about 20% of your equipment might be the most important stuff. That might really be your A rank equipment that's really responsible for like 80% of cranking product out the door. And it might also be consuming about 80% of your maintenance budget because it's so important. So if we could instrument that and do predictive maintenance on that, we cut the maintenance cost of that down in half. We cut our maintenance budget down. We make up that 5%. We put the Chinese out of business, right? It's totally doable. So my challenge to you is to do that thought experiment. Think through your plant and think where should we sort of take the first 20% of our equipment, the most important part, and make that investment to go towards a predictive or an optimized model to really open up a ton of value and make us as a, comp a country, you as a company, and you as an individual more competitive and really more life sustaining for the US. So that's my challenge. Uh, hopefully that's uh, something that everybody will take to heart and reach out to us and ask about how we can help. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, and I don't know if there's any questions from the audience. I'm looking at the, the QA. We've got a little bit of time here that we could take a few questions. So Elise, I don't know if there are any that you want to queue up. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Looks like one of the questions that came in is a question just about recommendations for what type of machinery they should start with? Yeah, so those are great questions, something that comes up a lot. Um, so like what is smart diagnostics well suited for? And really it comes down to a few things. It needs to be, it, first of all, it does not need to be continuously running, does not need to be constant speed. 
doesn't need to be simple things necessarily like a fan or a motor or a pump or something that just sits there and runs all day and gradually wears out. Uh, it can be complex things that perform you know, repetitive actions. So that's kind of the key word though is repetitive. So if you have conveyance equipment, if you have um, you know, any sort of repetitive action thing like a CNC machine or something like that, if it's performing a repetitive task, it's a good candidate for smart diagnostics because we can then instrument it and we can see how it changes over time. If it's doing a repetitive job, if you think about it, it shouldn't be changing over time, right? So the data should be very boring, but what we find is it's not boring. We'll find, we'll learn things that we didn't know about it and we'll see in that consistent repetitive action, there's actually a lot of variability and things that we can learn and then begin optimizing. So think repetitive action and then also think about do you have the, the capability to change anything about it? If it's a total black box and you have no controls and you can't change the way it works, then monitoring it might not be great because you won't be able to do anything about it. But if you can have some freedom to adjust the speed or change the load on the equipment or change the cycle time or change the ramp curve as it comes on and off, if you have some variables like that, then once you have the data about its health, you'll be able to make some changes and make it run healthier. Great, thank you. And another question that came in are, what are some tips to guarantee learning something from an initial installation? Yeah, good question. So uh, one of the things I like to point out to people a lot of times is instrument multiple pieces of equipment that you think should be the same. So almost every factory has duplicate equipment, right? You might have a bunch of conveyors that do the same job. You might have a bunch of pumps that are piped in in parallel and are doing the same job. You might have a bunch of fans that are all doing exhaust or, you know, feeding a furnace or whatever, and they're supposed to be doing the same job. They might all be about the same age. They might all be on the same PM routine. But I guarantee when we instrument multiple assets like that, we will learn that they're not the same. And then we'll learn, hey, we should treat. Take one to the track every take one to the track every weekend and beat the heck out of it. And then I just drive the other one to the grocery store. They'll have the same operator's manual. They'll both have the same PM routine, but I'm treating those vehicles totally differently. One of them might be really worn out. One of them might be in great shape. I don't really know that until I start collecting data from both of them and comparing them. So if you want to learn something really fast, instrument a couple machines that you think are the same and you'll find out they may not be the same. Any other questions, Elise? Uh, related to that, just, you know, what are some kind of good first steps to get started for those in the audience who um, may be prospective customers and haven't worked with us before? Yeah, let me add, let me go to the next slide here. So a couple of things. One, I would suggest signing up for the next webinar. So we have, there's going to be a series of these, one per week. The one next week is going to be really cool. Uh, it'll be one of our founding members, Dr. Gary Koopman, is going to be talking about specifically how do you apply our technology to optimizing an asset. And in particular, I think he's going to be talking about blower efficiency. It's an asset that's in almost every manufacturing plant. Most of them have room to be improved and optimized. And so Gary's going to be talking about how that works. It's a really nice applied uh, way of thinking about our data and how it works, but then how you solve a real problem with it. So I'd suggest signing up for that. And then we've got some contact info here. If you've got questions and you want to reach out to our sales department, uh, they can hook you up with some information or connect you with our Sentry team as well to discuss your particular needs. So there's a phone number and an email address there that I would suggest you reach out to. Great, thank you, Dave. Mm -hmm. Before we conclude the webinar, are there any other questions? All right, great. Uh, well, thank you all for your thoughtful participation today. 
We'll provide a link um, to the upcoming events that Dave mentioned in the series and a follow-up email as well um, as being posted on our social media pages. The email will also include a link to this recording and a brief survey. So please take a moment to do that if you're able to. And thanks, Dave, for a great presentation. Yep, thanks everybody. Appreciate you tuning in and have a great week.